Is your job search stuck? Maybe you're not getting any interviews with employers, or maybe you are, but no job offers. Or you may be new and not even know where to start. This is Charles Maxwood, and I'm releasing a new course and ebook on how to find a job as a software developer. The course walks you through the process of finding the types of companies you want to work for, getting their attention, and putting your best foot forward as the candidate they want. I've coached dozens of developers in looking for jobs and have been able to help several people find jobs within two weeks, two months. So whether you're new to development, can't find a great job that fits what you want, or are looking for remote work from an area without a strong tech community, I can help. Go to getacoderjob.com and sign up today. Hey, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Views on View. This week on our panel, we have Eric Hanchett, author of UJS in Action. Hello. Uh, Divya Sasidaran, uh, developer advocate at Netlify and View contributor. Hello. Joe Eames, organizer of the Framework Summit. Hey, everybody. John Papa, web developer and open source contributor at Microsoft and formerly with Disney. Good afternoon. Chris Fritz from the View Core team. Greetings, Internet. <laughs> I'm Charles Maxwood from devchat.tv. Um, just a quick reminder to go check out getacoderjob.com if you're looking for a job. This week, we have a few special guests. Uh, they are all from GitLab, and we'll let them introduce themselves in more detail in a minute. We have Taylor Murphy. Hey there. Uh, Jacob, is it Schatz? Yeah, that's yeah. exactly it. Yeah. Okay. Hi. And did I miss somebody? I thought we had one more, but the, the pictures keep moving. That's it. Okay. Do you gentlemen want to introduce yourselves real quick? Sure. Yeah. Uh, so my name is Taylor Murphy. I am the manager of data and analytics at GitLab. Uh, I started there this year in January as a data engineer. Um, pretty quickly stepped up to kind of the manager role. And now I have a team of one data engineer, one data analyst, and we're looking to hire another data analyst. So if any random data analysts who listen to this show, definitely apply. And uh, I'm Jake Schatz. I am a staff developer and uh, lead on the Meltano team. Meltano is a new tool that we're building at uh, GitLab, uh, which is a complete uh, data science lifecycle. And so right now we're helping out the data team and solving all their problems. Very cool. Um, now, do you use Vue just on Meltano or do you use it on other parts of GitLab as we're kind of getting rolling here? Yeah. So so when I started at GitLab, I was, uh, you know, on the front end team and that's where we first adopted Vue. And, uh, you know, after I think it was, you know, two years of being on Vue at the front end team and I transitioned onto the Meltano team. Then I, uh, you know, I was like, well, this is a perfect opportunity to kind of start from scratch um, and use Vue uh, once again. Um, now, with all of the knowledge that we had gained from the previous time around. Very cool. And, and you know, you, you mentioned Meltano in our, uh, you know, prep documents and things like that. But one thing that I'm, I'm really curious about as we get rolling with this is um, what does your workflow look like with Vue? Yeah, so right now everything is super new. The Meltano team is really pretty new. And when I joined, uh, you know, it was very new and it's still new. It's still something that we're kind of putting together. Um, but right now we're building uh, an application that uses uh, Vue with Vuex. Uh, it's using Python uh, with Flask on the back end. Uh, and I use the uh, Vue CLI to kind of generate, to get the whole thing started. And I've been using the Vue CLI uh, throughout the development. And then we use uh, GitLab to uh, version control the whole thing. And uh, we're working on getting GitLab to deploy it. Um, and it all sits uh, in uh, a Docker container that gets uh, deployed automatically. So it's going to be uh, like a single tenant uh, sort of installation, similar to how you can install GitLab on your own server. You'll be able to install this on your own server as well. Did you end up using Vue CLI 3? No. When I started, Vue CLI 3 hadn't quite come out yet. It was like a week after I started that Vue CLI 3 came out, and I was like, ah, oh, no. <laughs> but no, there's, you know, I can I can see if we can maybe uh, move over, but right come now on, we're trying to Come on, you're not chasing it. the most current technology every single day. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah. it, sh it shouldn't be too bad. I think most of it will probably be deleting configuration that you no longer need. Yeah. 
So, I, I mean, that's the thing is like with me, I'm just what happens is I wind up just like knowing the things that I need and then I go chase after them and I wind up like, you know, working on a web cap, web pack config for a really long time. And then someone's like, hey, can you use the view CLI that'll make this a whole lot easier? And then I turn to that. And then I saw uh, view CLI 3 came out and I was like, oh, well, not going to use that now. We're we're already moving forward here. So. so I don't think this is something that we covered yet, but could you just give an overview of what Meltano is? Yes. <laughs> Sounds like a super secret project. Project <laughs> yeah, Meltano. Exactly. It, it, is, it is a super secret project that's open source, so it's not super secret at all. Um, so Meltano was by, by super secret. He means, he means they publish all of their meetings on YouTube, right? We, <laughs> you can go on YouTube and you can watch every single one of our meetings. Uh, I just uploaded today's meeting. Wait, really? Yeah. Yeah. Really, really. Wow. It's, it's, uh, it definitely takes a lot of chutzpah to just like put yourself out on YouTube. When yeah, you, definitely. Uh, just regular meetings. Yeah. Um, so the data team, you know, uh, at GitLab has these problems that they're trying to solve, these questions that they're trying to answer. Uh, like our HR department, how long does it take to get from resume to hire? And there's like actual data behind that sitting in like Lever or Greenhouse or whatever tool we're using. And so Meltano just extracts the data. Uh, in, and this is, a, this is a data science thing, you know, we didn't make this up, um, but we're just building, you know, a common infrastructure around all this and kind of one tool to rule them all, but you extract the data out of that data source, which in that case would be Lever or Greenhouse. You load it into some database, which you call a data warehouse. It could be any sort of dialect. And then you transform the data so it's very useful. So maybe you want to know how long it takes to get from resume to hire, but that column's not in the database. So you kind of create that column. And then you can visualize it on uh, some sort of visualization tool. And Taylor can <laughs> Taylor can uh, totally steamroll anything I'm saying right now because I am not by any means a data scientist or anything like that. I am a front end engineer uh, that is learning this stuff on the fly. But Taylor has a PhD in this stuff, so he knows uh, exactly what he's talking about. Um, how was that, Taylor? Was that okay? That was pretty good. That was pretty good. I would say, in general, like data people are probably 10, 15, I don't know, 20 years behind kind of software engineers in terms of um, best practices and kind of these abstractions around the, the, process and, and the tools. Um, and one of the reasons I was excited to join GitLab is because I saw this company that's really good at DevOps. I was basically like, okay, data people, we need to have DevOps discipline because right now, if you're trying to start up an analytics function at a company, you're kind of piecing together all these different parts and it's kind of a nightmare and there's a lot of custom coding involved. And it seems like there's space in the market for something like Meltano, which is uh, a single application to kind of help you go from your external data sources, load that in your data warehouse, manage the transformations, um, and then and visualize that. And then the ideal for me would be to have it all version controlled in this you know nice UI because it's it's actually really hard to say you know where if this this bar chart you know where is this data coming from? Um, and if I make a change to somewhere in my pipeline, how is that going to affect this bar chart? And like, I have no idea right now. Um, so we're, we're trying to do as much as we can in version control. And we have the, the repo and everything for my team. Um, but that's like, that's why I'm excited about Meltano because hopefully it'll solve all my problems. Yeah. And that's then, super, go ahead. I was just going to say real quick. Yeah. The, the super cool thing about it is that rather than passing around like Excel spreadsheets, we're actually version controlling stuff. And, uh, you know, that means that you have to come up with like different ways of doing things because the typical way might be to, you know, use something that's not version controllable, maybe drag and drop things into a dashboard. But if we want everything to be version controllable, that means there's got to be like a file that you can diff, you know. So it's, it's really, really cool stuff uh, that we're doing. Yeah, I so think it's, it's so Sorry, interesting because um, I've worked on teams where the ETL layer or like the data science layer is completely separate from what the front end people are doing. And it's like the, the people who are working on the data side have no concept of how that data will be used later on. They're just like, oh, I'm, get, I'm getting insights and I'm like, doing a bunch of stuff. And like they potentially work with HR or marketing on like giving them their analysis of what that data means. But like front end and the people on the front end are like, okay, cool. Like, I don't know what happened. <laughs> I don't know like exactly what, what the transformation or what exactly those assumptions you made when you were analyzing and making those like 
decisions were. And so it's really interesting to bring the two together. It almost seems like it makes so much sense <laughs> to do that. Um, because I find a lot of teams having is- having trouble with like, they have a data science team and then now they're like, we need a data engineer either to like pull the data from whatever source that is or to like try to figure out how you can relay that data on to like users or internally within the team. Hey, Divya. Uh, yes. For those who may not know those terms, could you, could we like get a definition of the difference between a data scientist and a data engineer? Oh, no. <laughs> Sure. Yes, I can try. Um, so Taylor or, or Jake, you can jump in if I'm wrong. <laughs> but like my understanding is a data scientist does a lot of just like the what um, Jake and Taylor were mentioning, the extract, transform and loading of data. Um, and then the data engineer can be the person who's actually writing the scripts to grab the data from wherever, um, which is like kind of an overlap with what a data scientist does. And then the data engineer also like can be doing similar to what Jake does, which is kind of taking the data that has already been transformed and then working with it further to create visualizations or so on. It's kind of like, I think data engineer is a fairly new role <laughs> where, because data science itself is pretty new. Um, and then data engineer is kind of like the in-between, the, like that connects developers and the data science team. I think that is what my, I understand. Is that is that fair? That's, that's, that's pretty close. So I, I would define it a little bit differently. And I, I think, um, especially around data science, uh, that term can mean different things to different people. So how I would define it is, is a data engineer is um, somebody who's basically a software engineer, but sits wholly on the, the data team is primarily concerned about moving data from one data source to another. And they're also kind of managing the primary data warehouse and all of the data pipelines. Data analyst, um, in my view, is generating reports, should be able to write SQL, um, and is doing descriptive analytics. So it's telling me what's currently happening, what's happened in the past, and you know, kind of getting the current state. And a data scientist, is, I, I see, as somebody who um, is doing predictive analytics. So what's going to happen? What do we think is going to happen if we run an experiment? How do we you know, analyze the results? Things like that. Um, but within that, those kind of definitions, you get it's a it's a full spectrum where you get data scientists who just want to focus on the, the the raw statistics, or you get some who are comfortable with SQL and want to dive into some of the engineering. And so um, each person is is different and falls along that spectrum in a, in a different way. I think just like developers, and some want to really want to do CSS, and some don't. Some really want to do backend, and some don't. Absolutely, yeah. And so. And then in Meltano, you have a bunch of data. Does Vue fit in to visualize it? Is that what you're using it for? Yeah. So this is crazy because um, when we, when I first started on Meltano, it was just a bunch of like basically command line tools. And I was like, we have to get a user interface behind this. Yeah. Um, we had the same thought for Vue CLI. Right. <laughs> I was looking at UI UCLA and I was like, oh, I bet you I can make a user. Oh, they already made a user interface for it. Um, and it's really, really good too. So, um, yeah, so I, I, I created, uh, you know, we have all these great command line interfaces and all that stuff. And so then um, we're using a tool called Looker, which is, you know, a proprietary uh, visualization transformation tool. Um, and so what we're doing is we're kind of combining uh, what Looker does and the extract and the load and the transform all into one user interface. And just to start the whole thing off, I was like, oh, Vue CLI does Webpack configs easy for me. So I'm going to let it do my Webpack configs and it'll start up uh, Vuex for me. So I'm just going to let it do that. And and then you kind of just uh, start modifying the example that it, that it puts out. And that's how we got our... Um, you know, that's how we got our, our, our start there. So, so it sounds like you're using, uh, Vuex to, to manage the data on your front end, but you're using Looker, uh, to actually, uh, like render charts or graphs or fancy dashboards. So this is crazy because, uh, Looker actually is a visualization tool. And I was like, oh, I bet you we can make that. And so, um, I've been working on recreating the functionality of Looker. And um, so that's what I've done is we're trying to replace Looker. And so we're, we're, we're recreating a lot of the functionality of Looker and just, um, 
you know, writing kind of like a dumbed down version of it. Mm -hmm. Will this project be called Voyeur? Voyeur, I like that. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's like, if it would be built with view, it's like view, view hour, mm. I don't know. And then also looker. It could be called viewer. Y yeah. <laughs> that would make Oh, I, I don't know if it, voyeur sounds sounds cooler to me, but it's okay. We'll, yeah, we'll I like that. I, I, sounds I like a little it. risque. Yeah, <laughs> oh, that's good. Um, but yeah, no, no, the whole thing, it's right now called Meltano Analyze, and it's a part of Meltano. It's the like analysis layer of Meltano. Mm -hmm. And the really cool thing about Looker is that it, it has, um, you know, these look ML files, which describe the whole visualization and everything. A lot of the other tools like Splunk and all the, they're drag and drop. So by having these files, we can uh, do version control and we can do all that stuff. Um, where if it's drag and drop, there's like nothing to version control. It's all kind of built into a SQL database. You know, when you drag, it's, you know, put into a database. So we took the, uh, look ML files. And we wrote a small parser for the lookML files to see if we could just parse it using PEG.js. And, um, and so now, so now we're actually parsing the lookML files and we're using a uh, view to create like, um, uh, just to start off, like some sort of Git view where you can see all the files and all that stuff. And when you click on a file, you can see the contents of it. And then we actually use view to parse the files. Um, and we use that view on the server and on the front end uh, mm -hmm. to kind of do both. And so on the front end, now we're using it to actually use view to show the graphs, to show all the charts. We're using chart.js to kind of switch through a bunch of different charts. Um, and the, the, the dimensions and the measures and everything, it's all being uh, taken from our database, which was uh, parsed by our uh, page.js file and plopped into the database. It's uh it's, it's quite extensive. And then once you, you know, click all your different options, when you run it, it's going and it's grabbing a database connection. Like where, what data warehouse should I go look for this data in? And, uh, and then it's parsing it all in view. It's all very, very dynamic, which is really cool because you're connecting to any dialect of any database, um, getting any data in any format and, uh, and, and then, uh, viewing that using view. Do you find view pretty quick then for that operations? Because I'm assuming you have a lot of information. And but I guess the bottleneck would be in the the back end side where it's like doing the transformations and analyzing it and then spinning it back up to view. Yeah, this is the crazy thing is that it actually has to generate SQL to to run on a server. And I was thinking, do I'm not, obviously not going to do that on the front end. Um, so I wrote some Python that did some really just to start it off, some crazy string concatenation. And, uh, which is a horrible idea. Don't, don't do string concatenation. But then it turns out that Kayak had written for their data science team, a tool that was exactly made for this in Python called, uh, PyPika. And PyPika does like basically the string concatenation that you shouldn't be doing in a library, uh, and puts, uh, really nice functions around it. Um, but then, so it actually turned out to be really, really quick. It, I thought it was going to be really difficult. I thought it was going to be really hard with all the different information that was flowing through. Um, but the way that we organized it, it wound up really, really nice. Um, cause you use flask and it's just like, you know, it's just like using node. You just got a basic, uh, restful layer, uh, that's just returning JSON. You're sending it JSON. And, um, and so by using Vuex, it's just, uh, absolutely incredible. One thing I'm curious about is what format does your data take? Because obviously you're not sending it all the data in your data store, or data lake or what database or whatever you're, you, you call it. So, I mean, do you have different reports that get sent that kind of get compared to each other? How does that work? Yeah, so, so when we run, so the data comes and it, te it tells us a list of dimensions. Dimensions are basically database columns. And then it mm -hmm. sends us a list of measures, which are basically aggregates, uh, you know, maybe a sum or a count uh, and a way to do that. So the way that I set up our database to kind of like parse a lookML file is that, you know, you have explores and measures. And then I just have like settings, which I just use the Postgres JSON data type. And that way it can be flexible to accept anything that could possibly come in or go out. And so then when that gets sent to the front end, it gets sent as JSON. And because everything is JSON, it just like, it's really, really easy. And because Vue handles uh, like deep 
uh, objects really, really well, and it can watch deep objects. It just like goes into view. View watches the whole thing, and it updates the the front end in a very dynamic way. And if that makes sense, yeah, it makes so. sense to me. I'd like to ask a question here. Um, you chose view, and it's working out great. But the reality is you could have chosen a lot of other tools for our frameworks or something. Why really did you choose Vue? <laughs> One really great reason is that I know Vue really well. And I'm sure that there's a lot of, you know, I know React, I know, but um, I've like the thing, I always have like, you know, in, in the early 2000s, I, you know, I had my, my, uh, my IDE, I had all the stuff set up. And so the thing that I can like, repeat a process with like if i have an idea and i want to replicate it and i want to put it out there i always use view it's because the thing that's the thing i'm most comfortable with it's the thing that i like know how to do and it's how i know how to program uh really quickly sorry about that the, okay. so as a follow-up question to that then you had you chose view because you knew you had your expectations how has view either exceeded or not met those expectations as you've actually implemented this yeah so i think that Vue has exceeded my expectations. One of the things is that I'm trying to like, as a staff, uh, you know, engineer at GitLab, you know, as early adopters of Vue and, you know, writers of articles, I'm trying to write Vue so that when other people look at it, they're not like, oh, what the heck is he doing? I want to make sure that everything I'm writing is absolutely legit. And um, Vuex is really, really cool. Um, because it's got that flux inspired architecture. And so I've just been reading through, uh, the Vuex, not just the documentation, but the actual source code, uh, to see like how it does stuff and everything. And I was just really, really surprised at how simple it was, how it's just like, it's, it's essentially allowing you to place like these things directly into your components, but allowing you to separate them outside your components. And, you know, it's, it's using that spread operator with the map actions and the, and and the map state and the map getters to kind of like place that stuff into your components, but they kind of actually sit outside of your components. I just think the whole thing is is really really smart. Um, um, but yeah, I think the the biggest thing is just making sure that because uh, it, like again with Vue you can do things a million different ways. With Vuex you can do it like nine hundred thousand different ways. Um, you know, it definitely limits it. But I just want to make sure that I'm doing it right and that it right. you know that it's good. So I like that you used uh, the word flux there instead of Redux. That's a term we don't hear as often anymore. Well, I mean, that's what it is, right? It's a flux-inspired architecture, right? Right, right. But most people, most people just use the word Redux now. It's become the Kleenex of uh, the flux. Kleenex. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I'm so that's the thing is that I'm like I realize that it is actually inspired. It's not like a direct. Uh, exact implementation, as far as I can tell, I could be wrong. I have the experts here, so you know, correct me if I'm wrong. No, I, and, and everything is really like flux inspired. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. <laughs> what do you mean by that? In the sense that uh, you know, it was it it was an idea to start with, and then everybody sort of like made alterations and like built stuff on top of that that made development a lot easier. And so I think even Redux would be like flux inspired. Uh, I don't think that's oh, okay. direct flux. Yeah, 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 yeah. Cause, cause I was reading through the flux architecture again. Cause you know, I don't, I have, I read through it, you know, maybe six months ago or something, you know, you read through it every once in a while to remember what this whole thing was actually about. And, um, and you realize that like, like mutations, like view handles a couple of the things that flux is talking about, but it handles it automatically just because it's view. And like reading from the store and like mutations, mutations aren't like necessarily directly in flux, but it's kind of flux inspired. And mm -hmm. so I, I really like like the decisions that UX made. If they were looking at flux to make those decisions, I like the decisions that they actually made. And they did a really simple implementation of it. And then I like things where I look in the code and I'm like, oh, they used index of, I still use index of, you know, I like <laughs> it. I'll use it, you know. That's awesome. Yeah. So I'm really interested, you spoke a little bit about this, but I really love to hear more about the workflow and process of how you work with Taylor and like the, the data science plus the, end, the front end or like the web engineering part of it. Could you speak more to that process? Oh yeah, for sure. Because So this is interesting because this is different than the way we're doing it at GitLab. It's like the same, but it's different mm -hmm. because 
for all intents and purposes, Meltano is a brand new startup within GitLab. And I kind of call it, it's like, it's like starting a startup under the loving arms of an already bigger established startup. So we have, you know, some of that marketing, you know, to and help the money, <laughs> right. And, and the money to start up an yeah. engineering team uh, and to, to like, you know, a great person like Emily von Hoffman, who's on our team, who loves to use Twitter and who's really good at Twitter versus me, who I'm just like, I, you know, I just want to program. So, you know, really great things with that. But the, the way we're doing it is completely different in a way is because Taylor is like trying to solve and trying to solve all these data problems for GitLab. And so uh, rather than like taking all of these like, you know, things and trying to stick together these tools that didn't really, you know, that would take a long time, we're like, okay, maybe we can just build our own tools. So he'll say like, hey, we need uh, to make a lever uh, extractor and everything. And so then, um, we, you know, we put it in a milestone, we use GitLab's, um, like Kanban style board and we, what's a lever extractor? Yeah. Oh, what is, yeah. What is what's that? a lever extractor? Right. That sounds so, really fancy. Yeah. Oh, it's extremely fancy. No, it's, it's, it's really simple. So lever is what we use for, you know, for recruiting to, so when people apply to GitLab, their application goes into lever like greenhouse or uh, one of those other okay. ones. Mm. Sorry, so I should so have it's not like a technical term. Yeah, it's just like you're. I was thinking like this is like. Yeah, I, this is like <laughs> I like that even better. I don't know about. <laughs> yeah, I, I like that much better. It's a lever extractor. Um, a greenhouse extractor. Yeah, a greenhouse extractor. Yeah, lever is just. Um, it could be. Uh, we have like NetKey and Lever and um, Salesforce and all the different tools that we use. Yeah, so it's just, just a service, and you're extracting data from the server. Yeah, we're extracting the data out of the service. Um, and so Taylor's just like, hey, we we're going to need a Salesforce uh, extractor. We're going to need a Salesforce ELT. We're going to need to extract, load, and transform that data in Salesforce so that we can show it. And then in the end of the day, it shows up on a big screen in uh, the conference room, in our CEO's uh, conference room. And just like, you know, there's the bottom line. Um, but, you know, you're extracting, loading, transforming that data on its way there. Um, so then and- you're like grabbing that data and then Taylor does his magic <laughs> and passes it on to you. Is that like, or is it more like integrated? There's more of like you work together. So, so I would say... Meltano and, and, and Jacob's team is really kind of building the framework that we would use to, to do our job. Got um, it. Okay. And so, so like the, the charge for my team would say, hey, we need to know how many open opportunities we have. And we want to see that visualized on a dashboard, on a TV, in the, the boardroom. Um, so you work backwards from there. It's like, okay, well, we're using Looker. We need to have that data in a specific table. And so the one of the cool things that's, that's not really like, I guess, pertinent to, to the front end, but it kind of is, is, you know, we're trying to come up with this framework for extractors and loaders to make, to make it nice and easy to go from basically any external source to any database that you want with kind of a, either like a data frame or a CSV kind of intermediary. And we want that to be an open source project that gets a lot of community contributions. But I, I think we also want that, you know, you could hire one person who's responsible for the data function. They could use the Meltano front end to say, okay, here's my Salesforce credentials, here's my NetSuite credentials, um, hit go, and there's going to be some orchestration built into Meltano, the app that kind of manages the pipeline. Um, and then we have some basic transformations already built and then some basic dashboards already built. Um, but if you have a bigger team and you have a data engineer, maybe they don't want to use the front end and so they would use the, the CLI for that. Um, you can you know write your own custom transformations and things like that. And so um, I, I, the way I see it is... is you know, my team has our own priorities. Jacob is helping support us by building the framework to help us go faster. Um, Got it. And okay. To, to do it well, I think. Yeah. <laughs> and in the beginning, you know, we're writing those actual extractors uh, for him, but the goal is to make it so that they can, you know, have the tools to build their own extractors and to to manage their own infrastructure. Um, but the really cool thing about Meltano is that, you know, I had this crazy idea of like making it like uh, WordPress. You know how in WordPress you have that plugins directory and every plugin you drop in there gets kind of discovered by WordPress. Mm -hmm. And so what we have is we have an extract directory, a load directory, a transform directory, and any extractor that you drop in there that follows the protocol of an extractor will get discovered by Meltano and you can just run it in the GUI in that way. It's kind of like uh, it has a hook. Or similar to a, a view plugin. If you write it correctly, then view can hook onto it and it can hook onto view and 
uh, deal with those different things. That's cool. Deploy more, pay less with DigitalOcean, the simplest all-in-one cloud computing platform for developers. Scale and run cloud applications faster and more efficiently with effortless administration tools to robust compute, flexible configurations, networking services, real-time alerts, and rapid provisioning while enjoying industry-leading price to performance with a flat pricing structure across all global data center regions at any usage volume. Spend more time building better web apps and less time worrying about managing infrastructure with DigitalOcean. Build your next app on DigitalOcean. Get started with a free $100 credit at do slash co slash views on view. So Meltano is a mix between Python and JavaScript or like Vue. Yeah. So the back end, all the API stuff, and it's really just an API is done in Python with Flask. Uh, and it's just accepting JSON and returning JSON. And that's it. Um, it's not GraphQL or anything like that. Yeah. It's just JSON in, JSON out, uh, following sort of a RESTful protocol, I guess. RESTful, REST is like a, no, REST yeah. is it's, protocol, whatever. Yeah. Um, and then everything, the whole user interface is done uh, with Vue using the Vue CLI and the routing that it gives you um, and all of that stuff. So so does the analysis part happen also in within the Vue part of it? Or like where, how exactly are you orchestrating the data once you're yeah. extracting? Yeah. So, we're, so the actual orchestration of like the data being moved from one place to another is going to eventually happen with uh, GitLab CLI. Mm-hmm. And, we'll, you know, the, the question is whether we'll allow other orchestrations to go in there. It depends on how hard it is to do that. But what we're thinking is that we can allow other ways to orchestrate, but as a start, to use GitLab CLI so that, like, one, you could build this directly into GitLab, but then that would be, like, a requirement for people to, like, download and install GitLab. As a data science team, you might not want that whole thing. Maybe you just want this thing, which is, like, smaller and self-contained. But the idea is to maybe orchestrate it through GitLab CLI. And, but for right now, we're just, you know, manually orchestrating it to just get the data through. It's kind of a MVC sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's really interesting. It's really fun too. One of my favorite things to do is to like find some sort of language that has an extension that doesn't have a parser for it and write a parser for it. Like I just love writing parsers for some reason. And just the ability to take that data and to, like, it could be very, it could have any number of columns, it could have any number of fields, it could have any measures. And then we're actually generating SQL on the fly, running that actual SQL on a database. And so the whole thing is really, really cool. The ways that we're using it with uh, with Vue is really neat. And, and I would say one of the things I'm excited about as, as somebody who's used to using tools that don't have kind of great UIs is is the idea that you can have a tool that does things the right way in terms of loading in data, transforming it in a way that makes sense, that uses version control. But like the front end can also be a, a joy to use. Um, I worked at a company previously, they were using um, Angular for their, their front end, but like some of the stuff those guys could do with that was just super impressive. And it was like, oh, cool, I would love to have something that was a joy to use that worked well and, and made sense and then connected behind the scenes to um, these these kind of pieces that, that made sense and were doing things the quote unquote the right way. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping that's what we can do with Meltano and, and kind of internally with, with my team is come up with, you know, with, with help from the community, these abstractions and, and primitives that make sense and then have this really cool slick UI on, on top of it. So... I'm not a front end person, but I'm I'm like I, I share in the the joy and passion of, of beautifully well designed, well working software. <laughs> and so, they what we're doing is we're just like I'm talking to Taylor, and I'm like, so this is what I'm going to do, you know, or this is what has been done in the past. Is there anything you'd like to change about it? And then Taylor tell because like Taylor's like battle tested all this stuff, and his team knows exactly what they want. So we're just basically building this for Taylor's team and just doing exactly what they want because they know what the best thing is. So it's but we don't, but we don't know it all. And that's why we're trying to get other people in because like our needs are very specific to business operations. And there's other companies that have different data sources with very different data needs. Um, and, and maybe Meltano, like the way we're working on it won't work. And so we're very interested in talking to other teams and how they, what their kind of data requirements are. Um, so I, I like, I don't, my biggest fear would be that this is a bespoke tool just for my team. I want it to be useful for other people as well. <laughs> yeah. Would so it ever... 
contributors. Yeah. Would it ever be possible that you, I know you said single tenancy. I mean, this is a tool that people need to download and, and build and put together on their own servers. Would you guys ever think about hosting this somewhere for like as a service? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think what we're doing is we're just doing like the easiest thing possible to get this running. You know, that's always been kind of like GitLab's thing is just to go for like small steps and small iterations, but it's definitely not out of the question that this could be a hosted, this could be a hosted service because, you know, GitLab CI is hosted. And right now on GitLab.com, you have certain allotted minutes and all that stuff. So that's definitely not out of the question. Yeah. I, I think one of the big questions would be, what do you want to do about the, the data warehouse? So I would very strongly push back against any sort of move to say, oh, we're going to manage your database for you and you don't have access. Like we can help you get it set up, but at the end of the day, you need to kind of control your data. And I would want to see Meltano as the tool that's moving the data and helping you visualize it. And we'd host, like you, we could host the files and things like that. But like at the end of the day, your data needs to be yours, but we can help you get spun up with a, I don't know, Cloud SQL instance or Redshift or Snowflake or whatever and move stuff kind of for you. But like, that's got to be your data. <laughs> Yeah, I guess data is important aspect. You don't want to you don't want to be in control of other people's data. There's like problems with that. Yep. More data, more problems. More data. <laughs> so, so yeah, the I don't know what you talked about yet. Correct someone, correct me if I'm wrong. But have we talked about like where the name Meltano came from? Oh, this is this is fantastic. Can we go through the whole history, Jacob? Yeah, we can go through the whole history. Go ahead, you it's, start. It's, it's, it seems like such a weird name. So it's, it, yeah. It started off as just BizOps, like B-I-Z-O-P-S, because we were focused on business operations metrics. And so everything was called BizOps. They were the BizOps team. Um, and we kept going, like, this is a terrible name. We need a new name. We need a new name. Yeah, I would have done two Zs personally, but go on. Yeah, BizOps, yeah, right. Yeah. The first one that, that we came up with, I don't know who came up with it, uh, was Cashalot, C-A-C-H-E-L-O-T, which is a type of sperm whale. Uh, it was a what? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, it's a unique name, uh, but I, I I don't know why uh, some people love this so much. I, it kind of sounds like cash a lot, like money a lot. I guess. Yeah, that's what I heard. I thought, I thought it was like cashing a website, like cash. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I was thinking. <laughs> yeah. So that was a terrible name, and I think they floated it by some uh, GitLab executives, and they like bust out laughing because they thought they were joking. Um, yeah, cash a lot yeah. sounds like a website that I would be redirected to when I accidentally <laughs> missed the domain. <laughs> That's right. Or like some sort of payday lender. <laughs> cash a lot. Um, yeah. Only 52%. Exactly. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's 520, sorry. Then Jacob proposed the name. What was that name, Jacob? Bison Kick. <laughs> so what? I... I've had this um, domain since I was like 13 and I just always wanted to turn it into a startup. I didn't know what the startup would be, but I've had this like this one domain. And so I just tried to like insert it into our, I actually had like um, like a mascot uh, drawn and everything for it. It's, it's really cool. But um, uh, yeah, we didn't go with that either. So yeah, so we didn't so, go with that. But I'm, then we started- I'm horrible at naming things. You guys are making me feel a t- Fun better. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hey, let's talk about the naming history of Karma. Yeah. Anybody know that story? <laughs> you can make some mistakes in choosing your names, that's for sure. Yeah, so, well, let's not bring up that name. People can Google it if they want to figure that one yeah. out. <laughs> yeah, we're not gonna let's, we're not gonna go there. So, yeah, so we're so in the middle of this story. Bison kick in the end. It sounds like you 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 wisely decided not to let a 14 or a 13 year old <laughs> jets to name your product. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Right. So then we started looking at like, okay, what, what is this product doing? It's incorporating data. It's incorporating, extracting, loading, transforming. And so I started searching around on those uh, word generators, like what words contain ELT in them or ETL in them. Um, and so like, I got a whole list of those omelet was a, an option that was sticking around for a while, but that was actually really hard to spell surprisingly. And then um, then we were like, well, melt seems pretty cool, but you don't want to like melting. And then one of the engineers, uh, Mikhail, suggested Meltano. And we're like, oh, that's that's not too bad. And then we came up with the the acronym. It's, so it stands for Model, Extract, Load, Transform, Analyze, Notebook, and Orchestrate now. Um, and now that's a, definitely a thing that we're, we're sticking with. Model, Extract, Load, Transform, Analyze, Notebook, Orchestrate. Correct. What is Notebook? Jupyter Notebook. Jupyter notebook. So, oh, Jupyter Notebooks. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I think, Jacob, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, our CTO, DZ, isn't he integrating Jupyter Notebooks into GitLab? 
Yeah. Yep. 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 Oh, and and Jupyter notebooks will be involved in Meltano in some form or another. It's just a question of how, but yeah, that's, that'll be the last step of the whole thing. Yeah. So we came up with what it stands for after we decided on the name. <laughs> Got which it. Is really cool. Yeah. Nice. Unfortunately, it's not recursive, but you can't win them all. So. Yeah, I'm sure we could make it recursive though, if we really wanted to. <laughs> yeah. It kind of sounds like a Daft Punk album. All right. <laughs> I like that. But it could also, in theory, um, so the, it, it stands for kind of the parts of the life cycle that are more on the data engineering, data analytics side. And uh-huh. I'm, I'm trying to come up with the ones that are like more on the data science side. So it's like it, M would, could still be model, T could be train, um, O could be optimized or something like that. So you could, you could, it could work for many different things, I think. Got it. So, so we, we might decide later. This is, this is officially canon, but we might go back and, and decide that we, we want to change it. So yeah, we're, we're going to retcon it for sure. Yeah. <laughs> cool. So how how so gonna, fast ahead. does Meltano run? Like if if you were to like spin it up, is it like perf- super? Like I, I'm just curious in terms of the performance of it, just because there's like a SQL database involved and like a lot of pieces. Is it super responsive and quick? Or- I mean, the the cool thing about uh, using Vue and Flask is that it's like kind of minimal in what it's actually doing. And because I'm using Flask versus like Django or something else, because I'm, I'm like literally going in, connecting to another database, like I connect to our database to get the connection details, connect to another database, come back, send it back. It, it runs really, really quickly. Um, I'm just, and, you know, it totally depends on the size of the data. So we just finished making a GitLab ELT, um, which extract those and transform the data from GitLab.com. And, you know, you can imagine that's a tremendous amount of data. And I can't remember how long that takes to actually run, but it's, uh, it's a while. It definitely takes a while to run. But the responsiveness of it, um, the whole goal is to just make the UX that, that tells you exactly what's going on and gives you information about, you know, the things that you're experiencing. So, yeah. So that, that job took about like seven, eight hours to, to fully extract everything. I, I would also say on, on performance, um, it's, Part of the like my team's job is to uh, model the data in such a way that the queries that are being generated are performant. So it's it should be um, database constrained and, and like network constrained more than any um, sort of front end uh, limitations. I would I would think. Yeah. So there's a lot of moving parts to like what could slow slow it down or speed it up or anything like that. So one of the things is that like when you actually run the visualizations, like you return back a table of data. Technically, you could return back as much data as you want. So you just have to figure out UX wise, how do you show a tremendous amount of data? Are we now infinitely scrolling dynamic data and all of that stuff? That's cool. So I'm actually curious when you were building Meltano for your team, or like, because you guys use Meltano yourself, you build Meltano and also use Meltano. <laughs> I'm curious in terms of the visualizations, like how, how do you make decisions on what exactly you're visualizing? Right. So we're in the process of like switching over it. That's the tricky part is like, you've got something that works. There's nothing wrong with it. Uh, you want to use something that you created uh, that probably isn't quite as good as it yet, just because, you know, you, you're not a whole 150 person engineering team. You're just one, you know, Jake Schatz. But so, yeah, so we're slowly transitioning over. We're finding like, where is that point at which the data team is happy with what we have? And so we're just, you know, going to let them try it and try it. And uh, they just keep giving us feedback, which is super valuable. And then, so for example, one of the things was like, I, I put out like a bar chart and Emily was like, hey, bar charts should be always vertical. And she linked me to this page in this book, which was really cool. So I'm getting like all this really cool uh, information about like the right way to visualize things. And so I'm, I'm kind of leaving it up to them the way that they want it done and, uh, you know, so it, it, it's really cool in that way that they're just like, they, they have so much, they have such a wealth of information about uh, visualizations. And um, and so some of the visualizations that other people are using just aren't really helpful. And they, they're like, well, just leave that out. So, yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. I think I've spoken with Chris about this before in terms, because Chris does a lot of visualizations and I do to some extent. And it's always, you have to play around with like how exactly you want your to visualize your data so it's useful Right. Um, versus like, oh, this is super cool, but doesn't tell you anything. Right, 
Right. No, that's that's one of Emily's biggest points. When it, whenever I talk to her, Emily's uh, is on Taylor's team, uh, and she's kind of like the looker expert, and and she's really big into data visualizations and knows a tremendous amount about that. And so we've talked a lot about that, about like what the right way to actually visualize data so that it's actually useful and doesn't just look cool. And you're kind of doing this stuff with like really complex data, but you want it to be like useful and not just like, you know, there's definitely an element of it should be pretty because then that gets people to oh, say, yeah. like, oh, look at how pretty this is. We'd love to use that, you know. So what do you use? So I just use Chart.js because it was the easiest thing to get to get in there. And I didn't need to rewrite bar charts with mm-hmm. uh, D3 or anything like that. What do you generally use? I've, I've used Chart.js before just because it's really easy and it hooks directly into D3. Yeah. And so you don't have to do that yourself because working, tr- like I've done it, I've written view components that wrap around D3 and it requires a lot more work <laughs> versus Chart.js, which is like, here's how you use it and it's really easy. And you just hook in the components and it works. You hook in the data and then you have the components and you can work with that really easily. Chris, have you used anything like, can we use Chart.js or? So I, I have, but I, I really like using raw D3 personally. Like I, oh, yeah, of course. <laughs> I, I don't use D3 for the rendering. I only use it for utilities, which in D3 yes. or like it's, it's broken out into uh, like just like little utility modules that you can, you can pull in. So you don't have to pull in the whole library, which is really nice. So I can use it for like interpolation and for like, drawing you know an area like basically like doing some like trigonometry and calculus and stuff that like i I don't want to (laughs) do yeah actually shirley woos she does like a ton of visualizations with uh nadia bremer they they do data they run data sketches and Mm -hmm. yeah shirley has given multiple talks on like how she uses d3 for that purpose and then like she works with react and she's like react handles the dom and d3 just does the data stuff Yep, so I do the exact same pattern, but yeah. with you. Shirley's uh, given one of the kind of keynotes over at React Rally tomorrow as we're recording this, which will be a few weeks ago when it gets live. That's awesome. Yeah, and like I would love to take a look at uh, some, you know, some of the ways that you all have used D3. The cool thing for me with uh, Chart.js also is just that like within probably about like two hours, I had like five different charts that I could just switch between. The hardest thing was just, just to get it to like regenerate the chart because I was just looking through the documentation about how to get it to dump the chart. But like it handled all of the the transitions. It did all that stuff. It has the tool tips. It just kind of like, you know, from from nothing to something was just like a very, very small amount of time. It was so super easy to integrate, which was really great. And uh, when I showed people, they were like, wow, that's uh, there's your charts right there. So. Are you utilizing any, because you mentioned that Chart.js does a lot of that transitions for you. Are you using any of like Vue's transitions? Like, because Vue has like the enter and leave and ways that you can handle animation. Are you using that? No, not even slightly. <laughs> I just, um, I, I let um, Chart.js do all of its transitions. Mm-hmm. Um, my plan was to add in Vue transitions later, but that's kind of like uh, icing on the cake for mm-hmm. right now. It just, it's like, just trying to get it working. Oh, look at that. That's awesome. Yeah, so I just I just pasted in a link, which we'll, we'll link to it in the show notes, of like an example of how I use D3 just for like a really simple bar chart that, uh, you know, where we're using views reactivity, views rendering, and we're just using D3 for its utilities. That's, that's amazing. I find for me personally, it gives me the most power Definitely, I, I will agree. Like with Chart JS, if you want something pretty like standard, it'll it'll give you exactly what you want much quicker. No matter like how much you know about visualization or D three or view or whatever. Yeah, I mean, uh, the, but oftentimes I like to go crazy. <laughs> I think that's really cool looking. the The one thing that I think a lot of people think is that like if you use D three, you're going to be like recreating bar charts and all that stuff, but you know, this is a very small amount of code um, to get to where you are. So it's not like it's not like you had to like re-implement uh, rectangles and you know, like a whole drawing API or anything like that. Yeah, absolutely. And once you understand sort of what the utilities are doing and when to use them, then it opens up like a lot of possibilities. But I will admit, it does take some time to like 
learn when to use like domain or extent or like scale linear or whatever. You know, right. all of these different utilities that you might use in different contexts. Yeah, I think even if you're working with axes, it's it gets a bit hairy. <laughs> Because I've done like bar charts with like axes or like with, I don't know, what do you call those? Like little lines in the axes. Very technical term. <laughs> but yeah, it gets really hairy because D3 has specific ways of how it handles data. And like it expects a specific format of data to be in. So there's always like this. I think that's the piece that adds the complexity to it. But once you get past that... <laughs> And you have your data in a way that you can visualize it. You can like pass that onto view and then have that handle the rest. I call yeah. drawing those axes lever extraction. <laughs> <laughs> oh, ticks. But, that's but what I think called. that's just me. They're called, I've never they're heard called anyone else that. <laughs> <laughs> this is a good example of how to use lever extractions. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, D3 is just like, it just fits right in if you know how to do it. Yeah. Um, it, it, it does a lot of the math for you so that uh, really, like once you learn how to use it, when you're creating a visualization, the, it truly is your imagination because you can draw anything with HTML and with like the example I, I pasted here that, that'll be in the show notes is just with divs. So each bar is a div, but you can also uh, use SVGs, which are really, really powerful for like drawing all kinds of shapes. And when you need to be more performant, you can even use D3 with stuff like Canvas and WebGL. Right. For when you want to draw like a force directed graph with 50,000 nodes, which I'd probably recommend against because what are you going to do with that data? It's going to be, it's just going to look like a mess, but that is something that I've been asked to do before. And after I argue with the customer, I do try to give them what they want. <laughs> But then you can componentize Canvas and <laughs> create renderless components. <laughs> which, which I've, I've totally done before, yeah. So you can take, like, if you were drawing a bar with Canvas, for example, you could create, like, a uh, Canvas bar component that will draw that for you and, and it sort of encapsulate that Canvas logic. That's awesome. This looks fantastic. Yeah, and, and that's the thing is that when you're doing visualizations... You know, there's uh, there's always a million different ways that you could do it and all this stuff. And it turns out that the the visualizations that we're going to need, that like probably we're going to need in the future and things like, um, you know, there's math behind, uh, you know, if you have a thousand different results, you're not going to show every single thousand results. And the whole like, uh, is it the legend? Is that what you call it? Legend's just going to look like a, a, you know, a big black blob because you've got all that text in there um, and the math to try and like, you know, show only selective things and all that. And if that math is already done, then maybe it's good enough for me. I think we're going to actually wind up having to do quite a bit more complex things with Chart.js. So we'll see how it handles it. And D3 also helps with, uh, you know, things like clustering when you need to do that. And so let's say if you have like 50,000 different things that you want to show, but they're really in like six different groups then you can sort of collapse them into six, into six different groups. And then you could like zoom in into like lower and lower levels of more detail. That's awesome. Would you suggest if someone's getting started with D3 and wants to kind of get to a level where they feel comfortable with it, would you just suggest going through the documentation? Yeah, the, their tutorials, like when I was getting started, their tutorials were pretty bad, honestly. But they've gotten a lot better now. I think uh, Mike also- Bostock, who leads the project, has, has put a lot more effort into it. I think also like a lot of tutorials were were like V3 and then D3 is now V4. Actually, they're V5 now. And so like yeah, yeah. V3, V3 was essentially a giant library where all of the D3 functionality was in it. And then V4 split it into modules. So if you just want it, like for example, if you want it, the module for calculating max and min values, that's a specific module and so on. Yeah, and to clarify for people who might not be able to hear us perfectly, uh, we're talking about D3, like version 4 and version 5. ISV. The V, D. D3, it's still D3, but version 4 and 5, and version 3 is the one that was like just one one big library. You mean there wasn't a a library called D4 and D5 that was released as as a next version of D3? 
Wasn't there one called D4? I thought there was. Oh, maybe. So you've got C3. Yeah, I know, I know, I know that one. What's your opinions on C3? I, I don't have any strong opinions. <laughs> I know Joe has some D4s, D6s, D10s, D8s, and D4s. Oh, yeah. I do. I think I D4 do. was like a DSL for D3 <laughs> that someone created. <laughs> but yeah, it exists. I, I would say, going back to your point, um, Jake, that for D3, for me, the biggest thing for, for me to learn was just like the enter, update, and exit functionality because that's like a way of how you would put data into a D3 function and like manipulate it later. That's like the overall view. But that was like, at least I remember when I was learning D3, that was a huge thing that I was really confused by. And then once I got that, it everything clicked. But but again, like different people learn differently. <laughs> For me, that was challenging. And maybe that's like one place to start, potentially. Yeah. There's the main reason I didn't use D3 is because I, I just don't know it very well. <laughs> so Yeah. It, and it's one more thing to learn, yeah. It's an, yeah, it's an, oh, yeah. but I, think I would for, love to learn it. Yeah, I think for what you're doing, it sounds like Chart.js is working great. So this isn't, this isn't me saying that you should. <laughs> you <laughs> you you what's wrong with that? you? Could have done that in two lines of code. No, if you are a real developer. <laughs> <laughs> That's what Chris is really trying to say. Yeah. Well, if I couldn't get it working with, with uh, Chart.js, I was just going to embed a Flash app. So <laughs> okay, perfect. Yes. Really, whatever gets, whatever gets us shipped on time, right? Yeah. All right. Well, there are a lot of us on this episode, so I'm going to push us toward picks. Sounds good. Hi, this is Charles Maxwood, and I've been asked more times than I can count, how do I stay current? There's a lot to this question, and I'm working on a solution. Code badges. That's right. You heard me right. Basically, the idea is is that you come and do a code badge, and that gets you an introduction to a topic. Then you can decide if you want to pursue it further. But while working on the badge, you gain enough proficiency to be able to pick it up again if you need. A lot of technology comes through on the bleeding edge and not all of it sticks, but the principles do. So doing badges on the technologies that will get you ahead will provide you with experience needed to stay competitive. Plus, it offers social proof that you know something about the topic. The project is on Kickstarter right now. You can support it and get on the launch list at codebadge.org. Joe, do you want to start us with picks? Oh, sure. I can start us with picks. So I've been reading a lot of stuff recently on Medium from a guy named Ben Hardy, which I have found absolutely fascinating and really just point on about being motivated and being effective and productive in your work and making the right choices and how you stay organized. So I'm going to definitely pick Ben Hardy on Medium.com. I think he's one of the top writers on Medium.com as well. So um, that's going to be my first pick. And then my second and final pick is going to be setting goals. That's a great way to step up your game is to set goals and to set them correctly and do all the things you should do when you set goals. And those are my picks. Nice. Chris, what are your picks? My picks are first, uh, at the time that this is recording, UCLI 3 has recently been released. So definitely go and check that out. Uh, It's really, really cool. Makes a lot of like development tasks easier and also includes like a really cool UI. That's right. A CLI that has a user interface. You can go in and uh, run tasks uh, from the UI. You can, uh, for some configuration files, like for ESLint, you can see everything that, uh, like all of the different rules that are related to view like what exactly they do, links to documentation. You can, uh, you know, change whether they give an error, warning, or turn them off. A lot of really, really cool stuff. It's amazing. Like it really will change your workflow when you start using it. And then I also want to talk about the Vue Dev Tools, which we worked about. We worked on recently at the Vue Sprint in Poland, week before last at the time of recording. And uh, we made a lot of really cool changes to it. Performance is... like. The performance of the dev tools was improved a lot. And also there's now a performance tab and there's a routing tab uh, to give you more information about routing and more information about the performance of your application and of individual components, which is super, super cool. And then my final pick is if you are 
on a computer that is slow sometimes, I just want to say, get a new computer. Just do it. Stop thinking about it. It is one of the best investments that you can make. Like, it doesn't matter if you're like kind of cheap like me and, and you will spend like 10 hours researching anything over $30 because like, oh, what if you got the wrong thing? Like, I understand that mindset, but just like, just get a new computer. If you're thinking about it, if you've ever had like, oh man, maybe I should get a new computer, just do it. Just do it now. It doesn't matter if you've had your computer for like, just like two years or something like that. Just do it because it'll make you so much more productive. And if you're a developer, like and you're working on your computer all the time, that's a huge boost to your quality of life. So treat yourself, get a new computer. That's it. Nice. John, what are your picks? I just got one today. I've been playing a lot with the Vue CLI version three. Uh, love it. And my pick is I've been integrating it with Vuedify. I guess that's how you pronounce it. Uh, it's I've got the link here in the show notes. It's just a really nice uh, theming component based uh, tool that you can pull into your Vue apps. Check it out. Vuedify. Nice. Very cool. Divya, what are your picks? All right. My first pick is Data Sketches, which I mentioned earlier. Um, in the show, which is a collaboration between Nadia Bremer and Shirley Wu. It's really cool because uh, just to see the potential of what you can do with D3 or with visualization as a whole, is super inspirational um, piece of work, piece of art uh, that you should check out. And then my second pick is this Indigo campaign called One Climb, getting like 100,000 kids to climb. It's like a collaboration between Tom's and So Ill, which is a climbing company. Um, and so you can, if you donate, you can either get a climbing shoe or you can get a Tom shoe and so on. And then you help a kid from like the Boys and Girls Club of America get introduced to climbing, which is really cool. Uh, and it's a great cause. And then my last pick is a post that I read uh, on Hacker Noon called um, Finding Creativity in Software Engineering, which I thought was a really, really, it's, it's a short post, but it talks about how... Um, there's this misconception that software engineering is pretty boring and mechanical, uh, which it isn't because the idea is that if you think about your code in terms of how you can make it extensible, performant, like bug-free and readable, that is kind of adding beauty to code. Um, and there's like a really great quote by Donald Knuth, which is, which like he says, everyday life is like programming. If you love something, you can put beauty in it. And I thought that was very, very nice. Ah. It's adorable. So good. It's your inspirational views on view podcast Wednesday. Nice. Eric, what are your picks? Yep. Uh, I have a couple, uh, just real quick. I have my new course, create awesome view JS apps with Nux JS. It's out. I've completed it. Actually, I'm working with creator of Nux to go through and make sure we fine tune it. You can find it at school.programwitheric.com. Um, that's with a K, school.programwitheric.com. And in this course, I go over seeing tons of information on Vue.js over five hours of it. And then I'd have uh, two hours on Nux.js. So tons of information about that. And then also my new book, Vue.js in Action, is released. Uh, it's actually was in early access for many months. And now, um, by the time this podcast comes out, it'll be in physical format form. So I'm really excited about that. And that should be out by the time this podcast comes out. And you can find that on Amazon. That's Vue.js in action. Nice. Awesome. Um, I'm going to jump in with some picks and then we'll have our guests do some picks. Uh, my first pick is, um, and this all has to do with the course that I've been putting together, um, but I followed a tutorial by Chris Lemma on how to set up an online course with WooCommerce. Um, now it's from 2017 and a couple of the interfaces don't look quite the same, but I was still able to get it all figured out and make it work. So if you're looking to create your own courses, uh, check that out. Um, and I'll put a link to that in the show notes, building an online course with WooCommerce. Um, and then uh, get a, get a coderjob.com um, if you're out looking for a job. And like I've mentioned before, and I'm just going to briefly reiterate, um, I, I have people ask me this all the time and generally it's people who are new, people who had somebody help them get their first job and aren't sure how to do a job search for their next job and there's some reason they want to move on or people who have tr had like traditional employment and are now looking for something more remote because they don't live near a tech hub. 
or near a city that has a large tech community. So if you're any of those folks, this course is for you. Um, and you can go check it out at getacoderjob.com. And uh, yeah, uh, Jake, what are your picks? Yeah, thanks a lot. And congratulations on the books. Um, and thanks. so I, so in writing Meltano, you know, you always want to use a CSS framework, but you don't want to use Bootstrap because everybody uses Bootstrap. There's nothing wrong with it. It's wonderful. Um, but I've been looking a lot at Bulma, which is a fantastic uh, CSS framework, which I've been using. Uh, and the the way that they've named all the CSS classes and everything and the way that it's written is just uh, really, really, really fantastic. Um, so I think you can go to Bulma.io and check that out. Uh, the I have two others really quick. One of them is that you should read the source code of of uh, Vue.js itself and Vuex. Um, they have a bunch of really cool little helpers in there. Um, one of the helpers that I just thought was really clever is in Vuex, they have this thing that's called unify object style, so that when you pass in the um, the options, that it, it unifies the object style. You should go check it out. Um, so there's a bunch of little really cool helpers in there, and just the way that they write it is very clever, and I feel like you'll learn a lot just by reading the source code uh, and you'll see that it's it's actually not complicated at all. Um, and it actually makes the whole idea really nice. Um, and then the third thing is, is that I've been watching a lot of lectures by uh, Alan Kay. If you get a chance to just uh, go, just look up anything, like anytime he talks, just go watch it. It's just absolutely incredible. Um, the guy is uh, absolutely phenomenal. Uh, Taylor, what are your picks? Last but not least, I'm glad I'm, Going last, so I uh, had some time to think about this. So um, my first one is this awesome book um, called Designing Data Intensive Applications by Martin Kletman. And the subtitle is The Big Ideas Behind Reliable, Scalable, and Maintainable Systems. Um, I read this book for funsies, uh, and it's actually, it's really good. It has strong opinions, strong definitions of different aspects of databases, moving data around. Um, there's a... a Nice little website for it. Um, it was just a, a very well written, very clear book. And it's one of those you're like, I wish I could write that well and that clearly. Um, so I highly recommend that. And then the last one is um, this really great uh, Wait But Why article, How to Pick a Career That Actually Fits You. Um, I don't know if anybody's read Tim Urban's stuff before, but he's a pretty prolific writer. And I think this article um, gets you thinking about your career in a very uh, deep way. And you might uncover some things that are maybe, I don't know, traumatizing or scary, but it asks some good questions. And it's a, it's a good mental model of how to think about your career and, and what you want to prioritize and, and care about. So uh, definitely check that out if you have the time. All right. One last question. If people want to see what either of you are working on these days or just uh, find you online, where do they go? You can check uh, me out on Twitter. I'm under Jake Codes. And uh, the Meltano repo is on GitLab. You just go to GitLab slash Meltano, M-E-L-T-A-N-O. And uh, yeah. Yeah, and our um, repo is under the same group. It's Meltano slash analytics. Uh, and so you can definitely check that out. It's basically everything's open. And then on Twitter, I'm Taylor A. Murphy 1. Awesome. Well, thank you for coming and sharing with us. Um, this is really interesting. I'm going to have to go dig into it. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you so much. All right. We'll go ahead and wrap this one up, and we will catch you all next week. Bye. Boot doodles. Thanks so much. Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. Visit C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com to learn more.